I'm another sort of clinician. I'm a physiotherapist or an allied health um, practitioner. And so hopefully I'll give you a different perspective on being a clinician scientist or clinician researcher. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present, and also pay my respects to any Aboriginal people in the audience today. What I'd like to do in the, the first bit is just to give you a background to me as the physiotherapist and me as the scientist. So I trained in the late 1970s in Australia, and that was a really interesting time in physiotherapy for two reasons. One was we'd moved from being handmaidens of doctors. We used to get scripts from a doctor or a dentist and it would say, this is the person's diagnosis, follow these instructions. A bit like you would send a script to a pharmacist. And it was very prescriptive. And, and in Australia, for the first time in the world, we moved to a system where a physiotherapist could see a patient without having a doctor or, de or a dentist intervene. And so that was a really important um, step in the profession. The first time this has happened anywhere in the world. And in fact, the World Confederation of Physical Therapy wanted to ban the Australian Association because we took this terrible step becoming primary contact practitioners. The other thing that was happening was that we're moving the education from being hospital-based to being in colleges of advanced education to finally being in universities. And so it's a little bit like nursing. And so we're moving from this technical training to more of a university higher education training. And that changed the way that physiotherapy was practiced. And all of that started here in Australia. And still in some parts of the world, there are physiotherapists who are not allowed to see a patient without a doctor's referral. And they're still trained in technical colleges. Um, I worked as a clinician in Australia and overseas, worked in the city and also worked in the country. I decided I'd like to become an academic in 1990, so I joined the University of Sydney as a lecturer. Um, and I completed my fellowship, uh, so I'm a fellow of, of the Australian College of Physiotherapists in 2013, which is analogous to specialisation in medicine. So there are specialist physiotherapists in the same way that there are specialist medical doctors. In terms of my research, I completed my PhD in 1996. I became an NHMRC fellow um, in 2006, and I've been a fellow continuously since then. Became a member of the, of the academy in 2016, completed my high doctorate in 2018, so a doctor of medical sciences. And in terms of the metrics you have to pull out for investigator grant applications and things like that, these are the things they ask you for. It's a bit embarrassing. They say, you know, 44 PhD completions, about $70 million of grants. And quite a lot of publications, which sounds like it's the wrong thing to do, according to one of the speakers beforehand, and about 66,000 citations. But the thing that I think is most important is the number of PhD completions, because that's training the next generation. And it's really the thing that I'm most proud of. So what I wanted to do, because it's after lunch and because it's Saturday, is just give you three simple stories. So these are three stories which I think display impact of my research. And the first is to tell you the story about the physiotherapy evidence database that Russell talked about. Then I wanted to talk about um, paracetamol. So I do clinical trials of medicine and clinical trials of surgery. And the one that seems to have got the most um, impact around the world is the trials and systematic reviews we've done for paracetamol. And then more recently, I've been doing work in the emergency department to try and improve the management of back pain. So trying to do some research translation so what we know should happen, trying to assist clinicians to move to that style of practice. And so in the, the slide there, you can see this translation pathway, you know, from T1 to T5. Most of my research is on the right-hand side of that slide. So we're at the translation to patients, translation to practice, and translation to public health. So the first story is the Pedro story, so it's a physiotherapy evidence database story. So there. There are um, my colleagues and I when we started the evidence database in 1999. You can tell it's 1999 by the clothes we wear and also by the laptop, which we're incredibly proud of, but it looks, looks like it weighs about six kilos. But th that was state of the art in 1999. And the history to this was that when I joined the university, sorry, when I joined Cumberland College of Health Sciences in the 1990s, we decided we'd shake up the curriculum because at that stage it was very old fashioned. And so people were taught traditional physiotherapy treatments. And we were a bit disgruntled with that because most of us were doing our PhDs and stuff. And so we decided to subvert the curriculum. We removed a lot of the stuff which we thought didn't make a great deal of sense. And rather than teach people lots about hydrotherapy and massage, we did something which was a little bit heretical. Um, we started teaching them critical appraisal schools because we took the view that for a practitioner, a physiotherapist of the future, they'd be better served to understand critical appraisal schools, have a good grasp of that, than to be the world's best masseur. 
And the problem with this was that most of the evidence at that point in time was based on paper. And so we used to collate all these trials and systematic reviews and things like that. They'd all live in our offices. They'd all be stapled together. When you wanted to give it to someone, they took it away and photocopied it. It's just an incredible system. And we decided that was never going to work if we were going to change the world. So what we decided to do was to have a free online database of all physiotherapy evidence. And it was randomised trials, systematic reviews of randomised trials, clinical practice guidelines evaluating physiotherapy treatments. And we took, which you know, with hindsight, it was pretty brave. We said there'd be no language barrier. So we would archive research in any language and we would make the database available in as many languages as possible. And when I think about it now, that's, it's a little bit brave and a little bit stupid because at that point in time, none of us spoke any languages apart from English. I, I had a little bit of schoolboy Latin because I went to a Catholic school and I was an altar boy, but that wasn't going to be particularly useful in terms of bringing the evidence to the rest of the world unless we went back in time with a time machine. So that was the only language skills that we had to help us along the way. So when we launched Pedro in 1999, we found 1,800 records. And that astonished us because we didn't think there was that much research about physiotherapy. So that's 1999. And at that point in time, we only managed to have the English interface. And in 2023, as Russell said, we've now got 58,000 records and we've got the interface, so the search interface, and all the educational material, the tutorials, those sorts of things in 17 languages. And so we've made you know, what I think is you know, incredible changes to the way that we disseminate research in physiotherapy practice. So that's just a screen grab of what the interface looks like. So you can use it a little bit like PubMed, but it's just confined to physiotherapy trials. So if you want to find evidence about physiotherapy, this is more comprehensive, but it's also more efficient because you're not trawling through all this other stuff. You're just getting to the stuff about physiotherapy treatments. Um, but it also covers other professions. So really, treatments that are used by physios are often used by occupational therapists, um, exercise physiologists. It's sort of broadly across rehabilitation. And just to give you an example of what we do to try and create, um, I guess, a worldwide network of people using evidence, we try and translate all the information resources into as many languages as possible. So this is an infographic about a Cochrane review that we've got on the Pedro Facebook site. And on the other side, you can see the Portuguese version of that. So we've gone through with uh, a great deal of effort, not due to my skills, but my colleagues who speak another language, tra translate things into lots of different languages. So just to give you an idea how successful we've been in this dream of trying to change the world of physiotherapy, this is a graph of the world, and in blue is the, the countries that abused Pedro. And the degree of blue gives you some idea about how successful we've been. So more blue means there's a lot more searches. So at the current point in time, each year we get searches from 215 countries. I don't think there's many more countries than that. Each year, about 4 million searches, 12,000 daily searches, one search every seven seconds. And although we started in Australia, you can see that we've actually had worldwide reach. Our biggest users are actually from Brazil. And the reason for that is that early in my career, I think one of my early PhD students was from Brazil. So I've trained a lot of Brazilian physiotherapists. So at the moment, I think I'm down to supervising. It's probably I'm a grandfather of PhDs. So some of my PhD students have gone back to Brazil and they've supervised a PhD student and they've supervised another PhD student. So in Brazil, there's lots of people who know about Pedro. And they affectionately refer to Pedro as Pedrino. So sort of this diminutive form, which is an affectionate suffix at the end of the word to say they quite like Pedro. And at the current point in time, these are the different national associations that fund Pedro. So Pedro is really expensive to run. And so the way we get money, because it's, we, it's free, we don't charge people to use it, is to ask people to put their hands in their pocket and support it. So we've got 41 national physio associations. We provide money each year to help us run it. And in terms of, we thought it was just going to be a database that would guide physiotherapy practice, but it's actually turned out to be a research tool because we can actually study the science of physiotherapy and we can do all sorts of neat things. And so, for example, I could show you the evolution of physiotherapy science in this graph here. So this is the number of reports over time. So from 19, early 1900s up into the current point in time, the I'm colorblind. So the top one is um, randomized controlled trials. I think blue is for systematic reviews. Is it blue? Good, I've got that correct. And the, and the green one is for clinical practice guidelines. So the, the great, great, great grandfather of physiotherapy research is this trial up to the side, which was published in 1929. So as far as we understand, 
This trial by Dora Colebrook is the first trial to evaluate a physiotherapy treatment in 1929. And you can see the growth in the number of trials over time. And I guess the thing I wanted to bring to out, out and point to is that we started doing this, I guess, around 2000. And if we'd left it any later, it would have been a job that was impossible to do because it's grown exponentially. And the other point I wanted to, to, to bring out is that I trained in the early 1970s, oh, sorry, the late 1970s, graduated, I think, 1981. And at that point in time, I could have read every single randomized control trial in physiotherapy and still had time to spare. But today's graduates can nowhere do that. You know, there's, there's so much stuff out there. So the next story is a story about paracetamol. So although I'm a physiotherapist, I do clinical trials of drugs, clinical trials of surgery, clinical trials of psychological treatments. I do lots of clinical trials. And I guess unexpectedly, the work we've done around paracetamol has had the most impact. So when we started, every clinical practice guideline around the world said, if someone has low back pain, the go-to treatment is paracetamol because it's safe and effective and it's cheap and you should use it. And we've done a lot of research around paracetamol and it's changed those guidelines around the world. Some of them are a bit slow to change, but at the current point in time, about half the guidelines have have moved from endorsing paracetamol to saying, please don't use paracetamol for back pain. And one of the trials we did was this one here. It's the PACE trial published in Lancet. And it was looking at two dosing regimens for paracetamol versus placebo for acute low back pain. And if I explain the design in the next slide, we had 1,652 people with acute low back pain sourced from general practice. They were randomized to one of three arms. So some people got placebo. Some people got PRN paracetamol, so paracetamol as required, and some people got the regular dose of paracetamol. When we conceived the trial, we thought it was a trial testing two different dosing regimens because we thought, we presumed, and everyone thought paracetamol is effective, just work out what's the best way to take it. But at the time, I was stubborn. I said, look, you know, we really need to put a placebo arm in. And that's going to be important when I show the, the results of this. So at one stage, this trial was going to be two arms two different dosing regimens, but we decided to go with the extra work and put a placebo arm in. Because we used a double dummy design, the patients and the clinicians couldn't tell which arm they were in. So this is the survival curve mapping, the cumulative proportion of people recovering from their acute low back pain. Recovery was called um, zero, one out of 10 pain, maintained for a whole week. And what you can see is that these curves are almost on top of each other. and so. There is no difference between taking paracetamol, PRN, paracetamol in a time contingent fashion, or taking a placebo. And this is a really interesting trial for me because this was an investigator initiated trial. We got money from NHMRC, but we also got money from GSK. The GSK gave us $1.4 million, and my job was to go to them and explain the result. <laughs> so that was another example of the impact. The impact was on me, actually, because I had to turn up the office and say, look, you know your new product, you know, Panadol back and neck doesn't work any better than your old product, Panadol, and neither work better than placebo. So it was an interesting meeting and I managed to escape with my life. <laughs> and this is the first time that the research that I've done had major impact. And the reason I'm using this is because I think it's timely for a few reasons. So we published that trial at the time of the Malaysian airline disaster of Ukraine, so the, when that, the Russian separatists got down the airline and this is a picture of the king and queen of the Netherlands when the bodies came back from the Ukraine and the thing that I'm showing you is that even at that point in time where there's lots of stuff happening in the news cycle they were interested in a trial about paracetamol for back pain because the paracetamol trial is actually in the key position on the paper it's on the right hand column there and I guess the other reason I'm showing you it is that you know history seems to repeat itself there's a message there about Cameron putting pressure to punish the Putin oligarch. So things move in circles. But anyway, this is the first time that really had massive um, media attention to our research. When we did this, people didn't like the result. And so this slide's been scrambled, but there's meant to be a bit on things saying, what are people's reactions? And so the reactions were, people said to us, you did the analysis wrong. You've made a mistake. It has to be a mistake. There's a problem here. The next people said, well, look, you know, paracetamol would be effective if the patients were compliant. You know, the problem is poor compliance. Um, people said, look, paracetamol is effective for other conditions. There's something wrong about back pain. It's different. 
And then another group of people said something which I always thought was a little bit curious. They said, look, yes, it's no better than placebo, but it's incredibly safe. Just let get people using it. Now, it's just a safe placebo. Let's prescribe paracetamol as a safe placebo. And so we did some research looking at, I guess, those four reactions. So the first one was, you know, Chris got it wrong. And so we gave the data to an independent group of researchers who thought there was a different way to analyze the data. And so they mapped pain intensity over time. So pains on a scale from zero to 10 times and days up to day 28. You're saying, Chris, you've made a mistake. There's meant to be three curves there. Well, there are three curves there. They're just on top of each other. So when an independent group of people reanalyzed the data, there was nothing there to suggest that paracetamol was effective, sorry, more effective than placebo for people with acute low back pain. We also looked at whether compliance was an issue. So there's a statistical technique called compliant average causal effect analysis. So this gives you an estimate of the effect of a treatment if people were perfectly compliant. And so what I've got is the unadjusted effect sizes and the adjusted effect sizes as if people were perfectly compliant. And what you can see is if anything, the effect size is slightly smaller. So the negative result in the first trial could not be explained by poor compliance. So even if you're perfectly compliant with paracetamol, it's not going to help you with acute low back pain. We also looked at the issue of whether back pain was the outlier. And so we did an overview of all systematic reviews for paracetamol. We found systematic reviews covering 44 painful conditions. And essentially, it was quite interesting because of those 44 painful conditions, there was only one, two, three, four conditions where there was any evidence that paracetamol was effective, one condition, back pain, where it wasn't effective, and for the rest, it was inconclusive. And so we've been using paracetamol as a trusted pain reliever for a long period of time, but the evidence is just not there to support that. And when we published this, I think it was a couple of years back, it got huge media attention as well. So there's just some, some of the media that came about, TV, radio, newspapers. So people are interested when they discover a trusted pain reliever doesn't actually relieve pain. And then there's the issue of, well, let's just use it as a, as a placebo because it's harmless and it's safe. And so these are some data from uh, the Medical Journal of Australia look at, looking at admissions to hospital because of paracetamol poisonings. The first um, lot of dots are for self-harm. Unfortunately, some people try and harm themselves with paracetamol. So roughly going from 6,000 to perhaps 7,000 cases per year. And then all cases of paracetamol poisoning causing admission is the top curve. And so the difference between it are people who inadvertently poison themselves with paracetamol. And if you're looking at that, just look at 2007 to 2008, about 2,000 people per year are admitted to the hospital because of accidental paracetamol poisoning. And so the idea that this is a safe placebo, we could just dispense it, people probably need to rethink that approach because it can cause harm in people. So this is the third story, the last one. Stay with me. I know it's after lunch. Please don't drift off. And this is based upon our work in the emergency department. And um, we've been interested in trying to improve the care in the emergency department. And the next slide explains the problems we have. So if you look at guidelines around the world, they say that non-serious back pain, so these are cases not due to infection, fracture, cancer, quarter syndrome, so the garden variety back pain, should be managed in primary care, either by physio, chiropractor, or a GP. Um, and you should avoid imaging, avoid opioids, manage in primary care. But what happens is that in emergency departments, about a third of people turn up to the emergency department, sorry, a third of people with back pain catch an ambulance to the emergency department. So quite a few of them. Of the people who arrive with back pain in the ED, a third are scanned, even though the guideline says not to use that. About two thirds receive an opioid, even though they're told not to do that. And one in five are admitted. The average length of stay is 10 days. And one admission costs about $15,000. So it's a really expensive way to manage low back pain. And so we've been working with ED staff to see if we could give them different approaches to avoid some of these problems. And so it's very much working in partnership with the ED um, doctors and nurses. So the first trial I wanted to show is called SHAPED. And so this was a large trial we did at four emergency departments, three in Sydney Local Health District, one at Dubbo, and it involved 269 clinicians and 4,625 patients, nearly killed us. And so it's a step wedge cluster randomised control trial. You have a control period, and then you randomise people to cross over to the experimental intervention, and then you just follow them over time. 
And so it's a good way of testing an intervention to try and improve practice because you don't really have a control group. Everybody crosses over to get the, the desirable experimental intervention. And what we did was we tried to give the clinicians some tools and approaches they could use to avoid those problems. And so we used audit and feedback to feedback how many opioids they're using, how much imaging they were doing, how many emissions they were doing on the, the view that maybe they were forgetting about this. We educated the clinicians about how they should manage low back pain. So that's a picture of me on at RPA emergency department. So when we originally envisaged this, we talked about, you know, let's go to a tutorial room and da, 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 da. But if you ever turn up to RPA ED, it's just a madhouse. And so the only time we could do this was to sort of find some time between the changes and shifts to go and talk to the doctors, nurses, and physios about how back pain should be managed. We also gave them some alternatives to opioids to avoid opioid use. So trained them up on non-opioid medicines. We also gave them some physical approaches such as heat wraps. Heat wraps were incredibly popular. We knew that because they were getting pinched. So the nurses and doctors were taking them home for their mums and dads. And so a lot of stuff coming out the door. But surprisingly, they were really well received by the patients and the clinicians in ED. We gave the clinicians and the patients some educational resources. We also had a fast track referral service to a back clinic so they could avoid admitting them as an inpatient. So that's all that we did. So lots of things. So how successful were we in fixing up those problems? Well, it depends whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty person. So the, the three things we're trying to change, reduce the use of opioids, reduce the use of imaging, reduce admission. So the, the top curve, the square symbols are opioids. And so there's the control period, then the intervention period, and then the follow-up. And what you can see is there's a massive drop in the use of opioids. And so they dropped from roughly 63%, what does it look like, 40%. So the big drop in the use of opioids. So we were successful in reducing the use of opioids. That reduction at the hospitals was maintained for up to three years. This is an important result because nowhere in the world has people shown randomized evidence that you can reduce the use of opioids in ED. So the first time ever. Unfortunately, those other two things we're trying to fix didn't shift. So we couldn't reduce the use of imaging and we couldn't share, sorry, reduce the use of admissions. So that then leads me to the last two trials before I finish up, where we're trying different approaches to try and fix those problems. So again, working with the ED doctors and nurses, this trial's called Nudged, run by one of my postdocs, Adrian Traeger, who got some money from the NHMRC. And this is using what's called nudges. And so what we're trying to do is change the choice environment to subtly shift people in the direction we want them to go. So we've got a promotional campaign, which is, nominally facing the patients, but also faces the doctors. So it's a stealth campaign for the doctors. We don't tell them that. We say these are messages towards the patients, but the doctors walk past as well. And so the messages are about avoiding imaging and avoiding the use of opioids, and they're in different languages. We got the campaign put together by some advertising people. So we enlisted some advertising people. So there's an example there. I don't speak another, I think that's in Arabic, is it? Anybody speak Arabic? Good. What does it say? Good. Okay. So anyway, so, we, we, so we've got this marketing campaign in the waiting rooms. And the other thing we're doing is to change the EMR to have some alerts and some nudges to sort of shift them towards what we think are the high value alternatives. And so that trial is just about to start. It's going to be running in seven EDs in Sydney. And hopefully we'll discover a way to change, reduce imaging and another way of reducing opioids. And the last one before I finish up is this trial called Back at Home, which is trying to give people alternatives to admitting patients to hospital. And this is born out of, I guess, the use of virtual care because of the COVID pandemic. And so we work with RPA Virtual to design a virtual admission. So the person is admitted to the virtual hospital, but they're at home, not in bricks and mortar hospital. We have virtual delivery via video call, SMS, email, wearables and apps, all that sort of stuff. So lots of technology. They can access a whole range of services, so nursing, allied health, medical support, and we can also organise home visits if possible. So we're thinking this would be a cheaper way, but I'm also thinking it might well be more convenient. Like if I could be managed at home and be well managed, I prefer that to being in, in hospital. And a lot of this is being delivered by the senior physiotherapist, providing advice, education, exercise by the physio to the patients with low back pain. That started already at Canterbury, and we're going to roll it out 
to some other hospitals. And in a year or two, I'll be able to tell you if that works. So that's a lesson learned from the pandemic. So what will I leave you with? Well, when I was gonna do this talk, I thought, well, what do people think about physiotherapists and scientists? So I went to the source of all knowledge, Google, typed in image physiotherapist, and this is what I got. So physiotherapists get their patients to sit on balls and pull on rubber bands. And scientists are different. They wear gloves and they have a beaker and they have test tubes and they have a microscope. And hopefully I've shown you that there are other ways to be a physiotherapy scientist than those two things. And in my final slide, I wanted to thank all my collaborators. There's those trials and the things I've done are big, but they're only big because I've got wonderful teams of people to work with. So I wanted to thank them. I also wanted to thank my students and postdocs. And the reason I like research is you get to work with the most talented students and postdocs and you get amazing amounts of knowledge and learning from actually interacting with your students and postdocs. If you ever get the opportunity to supervise someone, you should reach out and grab it. And also wanted to thank the NHMRC because they've paid my salary since I think 2006, which has given me the luxury of turning up to work each day and deciding what I want to do. And if I don't want to do something, I don't have to do it. I can just come to work and choose the job that I do in terms of research, which is a luxury that not many professions have. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much. About the um, paracetamol trial, does the placebo and paracetamol still help epidemic back pain versus doing nothing whatsoever? Um, no, people have this idea that placebos are powerful. And you, we know from trials which include no treatment arm versus placebo, that there are some unusual trials that do that. So they've got drug, placebo, no treatment. If you compare placebo to no treatment, the effect of placebo is actually very small. So there's a Cochrane review of placebo. And although people have this idea that placebos are powerful, the placebos are actually quite, have minimal effects, if, if any, particularly for conditions such as pain. And they don't really have much of an effect. So I know in common knowledge and lay knowledge, everyone thinks that placebos are wonderful, but they're not. So in regular trials, then why placebo is still used then? That's to achieve blinding. So we're in, in a oh, trial, we, okay, fair enough. Yep. so in a regular trial, you're comparing the drug the placebo, and that's so you can find out the effect of the drug above and beyond placebo. Some people are arguing that you should just give people placebos. You can actually buy them online. So there's all sorts of placebo tablets you can administer to yourself. And if you're doing that, you're just wasting money because when, when we've tested it, placebo versus nothing, the effect is really quite small. Fantastic talk, Chris, and I don't think many people could match your statistics. Um, but um, I think you raised an issue that just hasn't come up today so far, and that is that you've got to be brave to do research. You talked about having to face the drug company and tell them that their drug was useless um, when it's probably their biggest money spent. Similarly, in the alcohol area where I work, you know, you're up against industry. Would you like to talk through a bit about those challenges? Yeah. I mean, well... There's challenges talking against industry with vested interests. There's also challenges talking to your professional colleagues who've also got vested interests. So I guess that the areas that I've worked in which have caused lots of uh, tension and needed to be brave, we've done stuff looking at the use of pregabalin for back pain. And so pregabalin is no better than a placebo for sciatica. We got incredible pushback for that. And like an opioid, pregabalin has terrible side effects. And so We've been doing stuff pushing back against the deceptive marketing from Pfizer. And we're also doing some stuff in relation to spinal cord stimulators. And so spinal cord stimulators, there's very little evidence that they're effective, but there's a lot of evidence that they cause harm and they're incredibly expensive. And so pushing back against that is difficult because the people who make them get a lot of money and the doctors who insert them get a lot of money as well. And so if you stand up and say, this doesn't work, it causes problems. And to, to put it into a real life example, we just published a Cochrane review of spinal cord stimulators. And we had a colleague in the United States who was listed as an acknowledgement because she advised us on it because she, her day job is to insert these things. And she's come back to us over the last couple of days saying she's getting such pressure from her colleagues, she'd like to be removed from the paper because they're making her life miserable. So this is for advising on a Cochrane review of spinal cord stimulators. There's all this pressure being put on this poor person in the States. So as Liz said, you have to be brave and be prepared sometimes for pushback from 
professions and also from industry. I mean, the stuff from professions can be even harder, I think. I mean, I've got a colleague, Rochelle Bookbinder, who published the vertebroplasty trial comparing vertebroplasty versus placebo, found vertebroplasty was no more effective than placebo for vertebral compression fracture. And she's been pursued for years by this interventional radiologist who makes a lot of money injecting cement into the fractured vertebrae. And she had to get her university to tell him to, to cease and desist, but it still keeps on going. So she's been, but she's an incredibly brave person. She's a, also a fellow of the academy and a wonderful scientist. Who said sometimes you have to be brave. Great insight into evidence-based medicine, isn't it? Quick question, one more. I'll just speak loud. Um, I had a, I had a question about Pedro, how you have sponsors who support the running of the website. Do you have advice in how to actually pitch ideas to sponsors and why they should accept them? So those sponsors have been physiotherapy associations and around the world, physiotherapists come under pressure saying, well, look, your treatments don't work. The insurance company's not going to pay for it. The government not going to fund those services. And so for the associations, they thought there was value in having an evidence resource that they could point to, to say, look, you know, our profession is committed to evidence-based practice. We're encouraging our members to use known effective physiotherapy treatments, not the other ones. And so that's why we've managed to get those groups to come aboard, because it's been quite useful to, for them to adopt evidence-based marketing rather than the usual approach, which is is mark without evidence. And so I'm comfortable doing that. And the reason that they cough up money is because that it helps their members keep being paid by health insurance companies and government agencies, which I think is a, is a good way to operate because it's based around known effective therapies. We want physiotherapists to be remunerated for giving treatments which are known to work. I don't want them to be remunerated for treatments which are ineffective or harmful. Always, yeah, I think my research focus has evolved. And so, although I work in implementation science, I'm not an implementation scientist, I'm more of an implementation practitioner. And so, I've got colleagues who have a background in implementation science who assist me along the way. But I think I've moved into that area because I guess I've done some research, discovered things work or don't work, and then frustrated when practice doesn't change. And so I'm thinking, well, I need, there's no point doing more trials until the results of the trials are being used in clinical care and changing the way that practice is, is conducted and changing the way the policy is set. Um, but yeah, I've moved to that area. Fantastic. So I think you've heard from one of the doyens of, of implementation science and clinician science. Chris Barr, thank you very much. <laughs>